I try not to do that after my talk. We <laughs> <laughs> still have two talks. Without further ado, it's uh, Johannes Weiss, who uh, obviously was an item postdoc. He would tell you when he was, because I forgot. <laughs> 2009, so it's not my next slide. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so uh, thanks, and I want to thank, of course, also Hossein for organizing this great event. It's always great to be back here, and I also wanted to show a few photos from when we were here in 2009 to 2000, 2012, exactly as Hossein was mentioning. And uh, I mean, I want to echo what a lot of people have already said, what a great scientific environment really ITEMP is, and kind of how great it is to see such a breadth of, of physics. And in addition to that, I also wanted to highlight kind of that coming to Boston and being able to go to see the Celtics is great. Being able to go to a baseball game and realizing that it's really boring is great. <laughs> this was actually Seth's look after they were warming up for like 15 minutes. And then I asked him, when are they going to start playing? And he told me they started playing 15 minutes ago. <laughs> so yeah, it's not for me. I got a coffee cup as a goodbye gift. I was a bit disappointed because I didn't drink coffee, but item actually proved to be very wise because now that I'm in Madrid and I have three kids, I drink a lot of coffee, and this is actually one of my favorite cups. I got to see the Austrian president that in Austria I never got to do. I got to see the local wildlife. Actually, this morning I saw turkeys, yes. which was <laughs> interesting as well. So yeah, it's really a great uh, place. Yeah, it seems they were running away. And so, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, kind of uh, a topic that we have been working on in Madrid with several collaborators for a few years already, where the basic idea is that in traditional nanophotonics, kind of the idea is that you tailor materials to control what you can do with light. You send it, you control, you concentrate it, and so on. But there's this kind of new idea, a new twist that if we can use the light, and specifically in some sense the vacuum field, to actually modify material properties. And the basic idea behind that is that we want to use cavities to modify the electromagnetic <laughs> environment. So in some sense, the vacuum fluctuations, which gives you effects such as strong coupling, polariton formation, and then seeing if we can use that to modify materials. And this kind of ideas have uh, led to some new fields of research, a field of research combining kind of ideas from nanophotonics, quantum optics, condensed metaphysics, chemistry. And exactly for doing this, I have to say that a lot of the things I learned at ITEMP have been really, really useful. And to give a quick introduction, when we talk about these different light matter coupling regimes, if we take the simplest model, so I guess for a lot of you this will be boring, but in any case, uh, if we take a two-level system inside a cavity, which would correspond to the chains Cummings model, uh, we have the light matter coupling that essentially is the dipole operator coupling uh, to the one photon uh, operator. That's what determines the field, the coupling strength, and that is proportional to the inverse mode volume, which is why you then want to make very small cavities. And if I do this, I have kind of different regimes. The first one is just a weak coupling regime where you modify the radiative decay per cell effect, essentially. And if you manage to increase the coupling strength more, you will enter this strong coupling regime where you get Rabi splitting, you get polaritons, the lower polariton, upper polariton. And uh, the eigenstates are then exactly called these polaritons, so hybrid light matter states. And in fact, you can also go, and if the coupling is even stronger, you start to see modifications of the ground state as well. This is usually called ultra strong coupling, uh, where basically this, when the coupling strength G becomes comparable in some sense to the excitation energy. Usually the limit people use is like 10% or so. And uh, an interesting aspect of this, or an important aspect of this, is that this is not actually a resonant effect. Because what shows up kind of to lowest order in, in perturbation theory is the sum of the energies of the two systems and not the difference. So actually, I will come back to this. That means that really single or few mode approximations are not very uh, useful here, or not very appropriate, let's say. Okay, so kind of based on these ideas, there's kind of two distinct flavors of what I can try to do with cavities. One is exactly to modify excited state properties, where there's actually a lot of experiments to do strong coupling uh, and get polaritons. 
And then I can use the fact that these polaritons are exactly hybrid light matter quasi-particles, so they interact, but they're also bosonic, and they have a very long kind of coherence length and so on, and this leads me to a nice effect such as exciton polariton condensation, long-range transport. There's examples where people have modified photochemistry, etc. And then there's also the idea to modify, in some sense, low energy properties, where there's up to now, I would say, mostly theory work, such as kind of trying to modify superconductivity, ferromagnetism, uh, things like that. And as I said there, you don't really need resonance. And this is basically the same effect as ultra-strong coupling. And in a different context, if you want, this is also really closely related to Casimir dispersion forces or Casimir polder forces. And uh, one of the things that motivates us in Madrid, and like the people I collaborate with, a lot of them come from plasmonics. And plasmonics, which are basically metal uh, nanoparticles, uh, have the nice property that they provide really, really strong field confinement, where the effective mode volume can be many orders of magnitude below the wavelength, because it's actually basically electron oscillations and not photons that you couple to, what we call them plasmons and we treat them as if they were photons uh, because it's kind of still the mostly bosonic and this allows you to reach really even at room temperature few or even single emitter strong coupling regimes and also allows you to hugely enhance uh, some types of nonlinear optical effects such as and you get to this regime of molecular optomechanics or nonlinear frequency up conversion where the ideas that I can use kind of and uh, this type of setup to, to uh, kind of effectively detect infrared light where there's not many efficient detectors by upconverting it through this plasmonically enhanced uh, nonlinearity to, to laser, uh, to optical frequencies, let's say. And uh, basically, one of the questions that has driven quite a bit of research in our group in the last few years is how can we understand exactly these quantum light matter interactions in such systems that they're really not kind of the typical cavities where I have a single mode or so, but I have a lot of different modes. And then after that is kind of understood, how can we actually use them for doing things like single photon sources, nonlinear elements, etc. So kind of the workhorse of the theory that we are doing is based on this uh, framework of so-called macroscopic quantum electrodynamics where the motivation behind this is that we want a quantum description of the light matter interactions in these complex nanophotonic structures. But kind of when we do this, the first thing we have to think about is really what do we mean with light and matter. As I was already mentioning before, like in traditional quantum optics, where I have a cavity with mirrors, it's kind of clear. I have a confined light field bouncing around, but it's basically an electro really a free electromagnetic field. The mirrors just give me boundary conditions. And then, of course, I do have losses, but in some sense, a small perturbation. But this is not the regime we care about. In the regime we care about, we have kind of these nanometer scale uh, nanoparticles with lots of electrons moving around. I have a small nano gap of maybe a one or two nanometer size. I actually, uh, according to some experiments at least, uh, you even see kind of sub nanometer effects, what they call pico cavities, of just a single atom sitting in a different position can change the response. And what that means is that now what I call the cavity mode is really already itself a mixed light matter excitation, for example, a surface pol a plasmon polariton, which is the better name than just surface plasmon. And I have usually, especially in these metallic systems, very large losses and I uh, have to really take them into account in the description. So how can I quantize this? How can I get something like a quantum or cavity QED Hamiltonian? So the basic idea between, uh, behind microscopic QD is basically to say I take my whole system and I separate it into the part that I'm going to want to treat like a quantum emitter, basically a collection of charged particles where I can then do quantum chemistry or something like that, and the part that I call the cavity, which is in some sense any arbitrary material structure that I just assume that I'm interested in the linear response so I can describe it through Maxwell's equations but microscopic Maxwell's equations. So under the approximation of local response, which is not actually necessary, but makes things easier, this is basically described by local permittivity, that is frequency dependence, and if I have magnetic response, possibly also permeability. And then the whole idea is to say, 
if I want to quantize this, since I'm only interested in the linear response, what I basically have, or what I want to look for, is a system of coupled harmonic oscillators that reproduce the macroscopic Maxwell equations. That's not trivial, but it turns out it's possible. And it's possible in a formal way where I can show basically that what I end up with is Maxwell's equations and the solution is the Green's function. So I can formally express the solution through the Green's function for any arbitrary structure. I don't have to fix from the beginning what structure I'm talking about. And then I can use this to quantize the system and I get the description in terms of this so-called quantized medium-assisted electromagnetic field, which is in the end just a collection of bosonic modes, harmonic oscillators. This was developed by many people, not including us, over kind of, uh, since the, I would say, 90s. Okay, and for any general system, as I mentioned, I get the final result that is always the same. I have a huge collection of harmonic oscillators that are independent bosonic modes. But as you see, I have one mode at every point in space and at every frequency, so it's really a 4D continuum. And in addition, I have polarization, three polarization directions, basically X, Y, C dipoles. And this is just for electric. If I have magnetic, I have the same again. Uh, well, that's the P actually, so that can, that can stand for electric or magnetic. And then the electric field, so this is just the Hamiltonian, it's a collection of oscillators, and the electric field is exactly given by essentially the electromagnetic Green's function, so the one of classical macroscopic Maxwell's equations from the point of the source oscillator to the point where I want to measure the electric field. So as I say, this is a 4D continuum. It's a formal solution, but it maybe doesn't look very useful from the beginning because how can I work with this? But I see a nice thing. All the system information is really encoded just in this dyadic Green's function, which in some sense is not that surprising because it's a linear system and that's what describes the response of a linear system, right? Uh, but how can we use this? Well, that's actually kind of as I mentioned, in these two distinct flavors, I would say there's two ways of doing it. If I look at these ground state properties, it turns out that basically all I want to do are these low energy properties, where I assume that the energy of the dynamics I'm interested in is lower than any of the electromagnetic modes I care about. All I want to do is basically integrate out these modes and get the effective Hamiltonian that I get from them. And this is kind of a few steps of derivations and lots of integrals and so on, and in the end you, we showed recently that under these approxima approximations you can actually rewrite kind of any general Hamiltonian with low energy excitations uh, described by a set of dipole operators. You can rewrite it through an effective interaction that is actually just the electrostatic interaction described by this complex, uh, by, the, kind of by the electromagnetic environment, by the cavity. So this is, uh, how to say, there's a lot of papers in the literature that do this with a single mode. You get completely wrong results if you do that. You get kind of, let's say, I have a single electromagnetic mode, my cavity mode, and that modifies my materials. If I do that, I get kind of long range interactions and so on that sound very nice. But if I say, no, I take all the modes, which is essentially what we do here, what you realize is, no, what you get is actually just electrostatic interactions between dipoles which, of course, with material you can modify them, but it's still just electrostatics. So, kind of the conclusion here is that single mode models can really give very misleading or very wrong results even. Doesn't mean you cannot use this for anything. For example, we then use this in a model where we assume that we have ferromagnetic nanoparticles with large spins uh, that couple to infrared active phonon modes so that you get effectively spin-phonon-photon interactions mediating spin-spin interactions between these nanoparticles. And it turns out that in this case, you get an effective bi-quadratic spin-spin interaction, uh, where again, this is just determined by the electrostatic response of the system. And this bi-quadratic spin-spin interaction actually mediates kind of an unconventional type of uh, magnetism that promotes ordering without actually preferring ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic configurations. And it turns out that if you look at the system, you actually find a first order phase transition instead of the conventional second order phase transition as you lower the temperature uh, below the critical temperature. 
Okay, so now I want to go back to kind of the part that we have worked on quite a lot more, actually, which is the excited state properties, where we assume that the cavity modes are more or less resonant with the excitations, and then I can get polaritons and so, and so on. And there, the problem is that the four, kind of this four-dimensional continuum is really not useful directly, because I want to work with something that looks like cavity QED. And the way to get something that looks like traditional quantum optics with a few discrete modes, and the loss is described at Lind, as Lindpler terms, if you want, from kind of what we have now in some sense, which is closer to a traditional nanophotonics approach, where I have a continuum of modes, and I have a Green's function that determines everything, is by going through the concept of resonances, or in some sense using the theory of open quantum systems. And what do I mean with this? Well, we can take our 4D uh, continuum. If now I think about a single uh, emitter, I can actually rewrite this in uh, such a way that everything is determined by a single continuum, because at every frequency I can kind of choose this so-called bright mode that the emitter couples to. And in the end, it turns out that the only quantity that I actually notice as the emitter from the whole electromagnetic field is this so-called spectral density which is directly related to the local density of states of the electromagnetic field, or the Purcell factor, which is just the spectral density divided by the free space one. And if you've done a, lot, a bit of open quantum system theory, I'm sure you also know that this is basically the central quantity in open quantum systems. And it turns out that in this case, it fully characterizes the cavity, meaning that any two linear systems with the same spectral density are indistinguishable for the emitter. And this is the idea that we're going to use to kind of re uh, replace the 4D continuum by a simple model system that then looks like a QED model. So just as kind of to gain a bit of intuition, if my spectral density, J of omega, is basically flat, this corresponds to a Markovian system where I have uh, no memory. And if I have structure, it means that the dynamics at the given time of the emitter will depend on previous times, basically that excitations can come back from the system. But for example, if I look at the system where I have a Lorentzian spectral density, so that I would immediately identify as a resonance, it turns out that this is actually exactly equivalent to a Lindblad master equation, which has a single quantized lossy mode. So a single A with a decay rate kappa, that is exactly the line width of my Lorentzian, is exactly the same as the Lorentzian spectral density. This was actually already shown by uh, Atachi Mamoglu, uh, again an item postdoc, uh, uh, 30 years ago by now. And if I have multiple lossy modes, I can get a sum of Lorentzians. And for many systems, that's actually enough in some sense. Uh, but it turns out that for the type of systems that we are interested in, it's not always enough to just use a sum of, uh, of Lorentzians to represent the spectral density. For example, if I have here two uh, plasmonic spheres, I see peaks that are not just Lorentzian, that are kind of shifted. And specifically, if I look at these hybrid cavities where I have some kind of normal optical cavity with the plasmonic uh, uh, nanoparticle inside on top of a photonic crystal cavity, I put in a plasmonic cavity, I get spectral densities that have these interference shapes, Fano shapes. So again, concepts from atomic physics, if you want, that show up very clearly. And then the question becomes, how can I get something that looks like, like a quantum optics model in this case? And one option that I want to mention is this so-called quantization of quasi-normal modes that works and actually uh, uh, is, is actually quite nice. I mean, I really like it. But it's uh, somewhat complex to imp implement that, and really only works if you have nicely isolated resonances. And in the systems you're interested in, often many physical quasi-normal modes contribute to the same peak. So we were looking for something kind of more general and somewhat simpler conceptually. So what we looked at is if we take the idea that I mentioned before of using kind of discrete modes with losses, but now what we will do is allow them to interact with each other. So if you look here, I don't have just AI dagger AJ, AI, but I have off-diagonal terms between them. And it turns out that you can then again show that this is exactly equivalent to having a spectral density that is given by this, com uh, this compact expression where you get the inverse of the matrix 
that contains the couplings on the real part and the, the decay rates on the diagonal. But it turns out that this already gives you a huge amount of flexibility compared to just the sum of Lorentzians. And now, if I want to reproduce kind of some spec complex spectral density, I just, just need to basically do nonlinear fitting and adjust the parameters if, of this model Hamiltonian to get back a simple model system consisting of a few coupled harmonic oscillators. So, kind of to check how well this works, we took this relatively complex system. This is a, a semiconductor dielectric sphere with a, nano, a parasmonic nano antenna in, embedded in it, and you get this spectral density with kind of uh, lots of resonances and specifically uh, interference peaks. And it turns out with this interacting mode model, I can fit this essentially perfectly with 20 modes. If I try to use this quasi-normal approach, it would need orders of magnitude more modes to get this to converge. And again, if I try to do this without allowing the modes to interact, I really uh, cannot get it to converge. I would again, I could do it, but with a huge amount of modes. So what this really means is that now we have a direct mapping in some sense between complex nanophotonic structures and quantum optics models. And what we also see is that in general, we need interacting modes, which is really the same as saying that couplings and losses do not commute. So this is really a non-Hermitian system where the couplings and the losses are non-commutative. And this in some sense implies that these kind of mode interactions are really an intrinsic feature of nanophotonic systems. And then there's actually a lot of nice things you can do with it. So in the interest of time, uh, I mean, we check that it works, as you would expect. It doesn't have to be two-level systems. You, for example, if you take this four-level emitter, you also get perfect agreement between the model and an exact calculation. The model also gives us, for example, direct access to the spatially resolved electromagnetic field. So if we look at spontaneous emission, we can now see really how the field propagates out of this complex nanophotonic structure. And uh, it turns out we can also relatively easily go to not just a single emitter, but a collection of emitters. You just need to allow the coupling to basically become a matrix instead of a single vector. But apart from that, nothing else changes. Again, I don't want, just want to go through this very quickly. And again, this reproduces the dynamics. If I have here three emitters, I can look at energy transfer from one to the other, and so on with a relatively small model. And this kind of perspective turns out to also be very useful in a lot of other contexts. For example, in this ultra-strong coupling community, it has been known for a long time that you cannot use normal Lindblad decay terms for the emitters if I'm in ultra-strong coupling because you get artificial pumping. And if I use this spectral density perspective, where I know that the Lindblad term corresponds to a Lorentzian, I realize very easily why this is, because a Lorentzian is not only confined to positive frequencies, which is actually what the physical densities are, because I only have positive frequency photons, but extends over the whole real axis. And if I have negative frequency photons, that means I can absorb a negative frequency, uh, I can emit the negative frequency photon, which is the same as absorbing uh, energy, and then I get this artificial pumping. And it turns out that now with this uh, coupled mode model, I can actually uh, kind of go a step further and make sure that I have a spectral density with a few coupled modes where I suppress these negative frequencies and then I'm able to represent uh, this ultra strongly coupled system with a fully standard Lindblad master equation just with a few coupled modes, which uh, up to now had not been shown. And another very nice thing is kind of if I want to look for new physics, because of these interacting modes, it turns out that this has not been studied much, right? And uh, for example, one effect that we found is that if I take a system, which is again one of these hybrid cavities, a, a cavity mode coupled to a plasmonic mode, I can find what we called a non Hermitian photon blockade, which is basically a photon blockade where I get single photon emission not because I get energy detuning. So usually, if I want a single photon emission, what I want to do is that. I prevent a second photon to be absorbed after under driving uh, by not having any state resonant. And what I get here in this setup is actually that my second excitation subspace becomes much broader in energy than the first one because exactly of this uh, non-hermitian character of the couplings. 
And uh, with that, I already want to finish and thank uh, all my team members and collaborators. And thank you for your attention. Questions for Okay, I got it. Thanks for the nice talk, Johannes. I just have one question about this result about the electrostatic forces. Right. What are the assumptions for the material system? Because, for example, <coughs> even in classical electromagnetism, for moving electrons, you will have retardation effects and so on. So yeah, retardation is fully there. It is there. So it your particles there. are moving there. They are not just localized dipoles. Because that's the, the impression that I got. It's the dipole operators at a specific point in space. Okay. So the particles... So they're not two-level systems which are not moving, that's what I'm saying. No, they don't have to be two-level systems at all. I mean, okay. okay. They are just described by a dipole. And in fact, I mean, here I wrote it with localized dipoles. We already showed that you, can, you don't have to use the dipole approximation even. You can just write it as the integral over okay. the polarization density. Okay. So we don't have any approximations about those. What we assume is that the dynamics of the system we are interested in is low frequency. Lower frequency than the relevant uh, resonances in the photonic ah, system. So resonance, uh, resonant coupling is somehow not negative. It's non-resonant, yeah. It's non-resonant. We're not saying all of electrodynamics is static. That okay. would be crazy. Okay. Right? That's, that's the impression I got, so I was a bit... Uh, no, was, no, no, okay. no. But okay. this is the approximation that is used in a lot of the papers in exactly looking at this. Yeah. That at some point you say, my excitations in the low frequency subspace are much lower energy than the photonic ones. Okay, I get it now. I, get so it. I, underst I understand. This, this is the okay. approximation. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Jean? So this decomposition into normal modes, is that in some, some, some sense uh, unique? The quasi-normal modes? Yeah. That is, in principle, unique, apart from choosing kind of outgoing or incoming boundary conditions or something like that, but yeah. In principle, yes, okay. but the quantization is not just doing that. Kind of. So, I mean, like the quasi-normal modes in terms of eigenstates of the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, or the non-Hermitian, sorry, Maxwell equations, those are unique. But then for the quantization, they actually have to assume that you only treat a few and the others give the bath that gives the Markovian losses. So there's a few steps there in the derivation that maybe are a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Cool. Okay. Any more? Okay. Then uh, thank you very much, Johannes, for a nice talk. And 